Have your seats. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it's so good to see you guys in the midst of the rain and it's kind of dreary today, but you still pressed your way to be here. For those of you that don't know, my name is Vernell Samuel. I'm the senior leader here of Hungry For God Church. And we are the greatest church here in Brooklyn, New York, if you didn't know. We have some of the greatest people on this side of heaven. It's true. This is not your grandmother's church. They're a little different. <laughs> As you can see, I don't have a, a robe on or a tie. A three-piece suit, patent leather shoes on. But I'm a little dressed up today, as you can see. I got on some, some khakis. I'm a little dressed up. But we made that clear. One of the things that we did when we started our church is that we wanted this church to be a church that will eliminate the excuses that people had as to why they won't come to church. So people say church is too early. We start in the afternoon. So you can sleep in. If you clubbed last night, you can wake up a little late. <laughs> if you say, I don't have church clothes, we got you. We dress down. So those are like two of the biggest excuses people make why they can't come to church. <laughs> I have nothing to wear or it's too early. Hallelujah. But today is a special Sunday. And for those, again, if you're here for the first time, um, today is something that we call Vision Sunday. Everybody say Vision Sunday. Yeah. And Vision Sundays, again, is a little different because I'm not going to preach like a full sermon or a full message like I would typically do. Uh, however, we're going to have more like a family talk or a family meeting where we're going to discuss uh, some things about what we believe or what we sense and what we foresee God is going to do for the next 12 months of our church and ultimately give you the opportunity to know how you can play a part in that vision coming to pass. Amen. Um, I believe that there is no greater fulfillment and no greater sense of joy in your life when you live your life for the well-being and for the safety of others. In other words, um, you can try to you can try to uh, feel for, get fulfillment out of satisfying all of your wants and all of your needs and all of your pleasures. But Jesus tells us that if a man or woman wants to find their life, they actually have to lose their life that you have to give up your life in order to actually find your life. It's an interesting paradox, right? Because, you know, um, initially we come into this world selfish. Anybody with, a, with, with any children or a baby can, knows what I'm talking about. Children don't care how you feel. They don't care if you had enough sleep last night, if you're tired, if you're broke, if you got it or not. One, kids want what they want when they want it, and if you don't give it to them, they're going to cry their heads off until they get what they want. <laughs> we come into this world selfish. And that's why maturity is learning how to become selfless. You start off selfish, and as you mature, you realize life is not about you. <laughs> you realize that the world doesn't revolve around you and your wants and your needs, and learning how to manage your selfishness, because you, you still got to be a little selfish. You got to look after yourself. Um, Jesus tells us that we need to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So the goal of selflessness is not to deny yourself to the point where you don't look after yourself, but you, you, you begin to look after other people, or, or, or as Paul writes, is that um, we need to, he says, um, we need to think of ourselves, don't think of ourselves too highly, but think of others as well. So it's just all about learning how to, for me, I like to make sure that I'm good to the point where I don't have to think about myself. 
I've gotten to a point in my relationship with God where I, I really have to ask God for things. I don't have to ask God for much for me because God supplies my needs. He takes care of me. So he blessed me to the point where I'm so blessed that I look at how I can be a blessing to others. And blessing is so much bigger than just finance and money. If you got Jesus in your life, if you got Jesus in your heart, you are already blessed and you can bless somebody else with that revelation of Jesus that you have. If you know how to pray, you can bless somebody with a prayer. One of the things we love to do is when we go out on the streets as a church with our outreach, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these things, but when we go out and we do outreach as a church, you know, it's so amazing how receptive people are when you ask to pray for them. Yes. See, the outreach team could tell you. You would think that people will probably reject you, but no, people are looking for it. They want an encounter with God wherever it's going to come from. And I really believe that God is raising up a people in this place that are going to literally be like, you're going to be like personal escorts for the kingdom of God where people are going to meet you and you're going to escort them in to the presence of God. You're going to introduce them to the living God, not the fake God, not a, not a religious Jesus, but the living, resurrected Jesus who sits high and looks down low, the same Jesus that rose again from the dead, He's now with us. And the Bible says that he has made his church his hands and his feet. That if Jesus wants to get to somebody, he has to, he has to use somebody to get to somebody. You are the body of Christ. Say, I am the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Miracles are going to happen through you this year. I didn't just say that they're going to happen for you. They're going to happen through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you get a bigger vision for your life and you begin to think outside of your own personal comfort box, then I'm telling you, man, the, the, the Bible says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger. It's the message version. But the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And so this Vision Sunday, like I said, we're going to be talking about some things that uh, are coming down a pipeline for this house. And like I said, whether this is your first Sunday or you've been here for quite some time, I pray that after this Sunday, there's going to be some vision or something's going to come alive in your heart where you're going to think about how you can play a part in helping to bring God's dream or God's vision on the earth to come to pass. Just quickly, um, how many of you have been attending Hungry for God? Just with a show of hands, how many of you have been attending Hungry for God, let's say, uh, before the pandemic? How many of you here before the pandemic? All right. How many of you started coming to Hungry for God after the pandemic? Let me see. <laughs> In all of this boat. It's like half and half. Look at all these pandemic babies. <laughs> and uh, how many of you have been coming, let's say, for the last year, past year? Past year. Past year, Jeffrey. Past year. Hey, Amen. We got about eight, nine, ten people in this place who started coming just a year ago. How many of you started coming in the last three months? Let's see, any newbies? Hey, Amen. Come on. We got, yes. Wow. So, so, again, it's, it's, a, it's a joy and a privilege. As Sherry mentioned, like, we're, one of our desires this year is to just see our house grow, to see the family of God grow. And I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, God is going to do something supernatural in this year in this house in the area of growth. And I'm excited about that. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, uh, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. And I'm going to read the King James Version, the old school translation. How many of you have been enjoying our Bible uh, reading journey? We've been going through the Bible. We're reading the Bible this year. Yeah. Again, we're reading the Bible from cover to cover this year. Well, actually not cover to cover, from, but from for chronological order. 
chronological order. Because somebody asked, like, why are we reading Job already? And we just started. Because Job, if you didn't know, is one of the oldest books in the Bible. Job is one of the oldest books. So although Job is like a little later in the Old Testament, it really, from a timeline point of view, Job lived before a lot of the patriarchs. He lived before Moses, before Abraham. I'm mean, sorry, before, not after, uh, before Abraham, before David and all those guys. So we're going through a chronological order. And if you're in this room and you want to join us, it's not too late. But um, Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this. Where there is no vision... The people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Another translation says where there is no revelation, where there is no divine guidance, people cast off all restraints. I love this verse so much because... It shows us that the reason why so many people perish in life, why so many people feel like their lives don't, ex don't, don't accelerate, that they have no progress, that they, their lives feel like they're stuck or motionless or aimless, where they seem like they can't ever get ahead. The Bible points to the fact that it's not because there's a lack of resources or a lack of money. He didn't say it's because of your, uh, you don't have the right last name. You don't have the right last name. Or um, because you're not a part of a secret society. Because you're not Illuminati, you can't succeed. The reason why the Bible lets us know people perish is because they lack vision. Everybody say vision. It's a lack of vision. Vision is not the same as sight or seeing. Natural sight or sight is natural, but vision is spiritual. And when you have vision, you have the ability to see long term. You're, you're not stuck on looking at what has been, but you're able to see what's going to come in the future. And again, if there is no vision, people perish. People cast off restraints. Vision gives a, 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 a discipline a place in your life. When people lack vision, they lack discipline. You cast off restraints when you don't have vision. Vision is the reason why if you're in school and you have a vision of say, hey, I want to graduate high school so that I can go to college, so that I can get a, a great job or a great career, and I want to be able to, to live in the neighborhood I want to live in and put my kids in the school that I want to put them in, and I want to be able to drive the cars that I want to drive, and I don't want to depend on government assistance all my life. I want to be the first one to graduate school in my family. I want to be the, the generational curse breaker. Vision gives discipline a purpose. Because now I'm going to make, force myself to wake up. I'm going to force myself to, to not go out. And I'm going to make sure that I stay committed to the vision that I have. I have a vision that I want my body to look the way I want it to look by the summertime. I got vision that right now I'm not going to eat those patty pies that I want to eat right now. Fried chicken every night. Because I want, I have a vision of how I want my body to look by the summer. So you say, what, well, summer bodies are made when? In the winter. See, vision gives not only discipline a place in your life, but vision also gives pain a purpose in your life. You are willing to delay gratification. You, you don't have to, you don't have to um, um, jump on every pleasure, that opportunity that comes your way, because I understand that I have a vision for something greater than my immediate pleasure and gain. We need vision for our lives, church. And the Bible says where the people, where there is no vision, the people 
perish. So I pray that Hungry for God will be a church full of people with vision. I want, um, I want you to be full of vision for your family. I want you to be full of vision for your business. Because if your business is perishing, you got a vision problem. If your marriage is not going the way you want it to go, it's because you have a vision problem. You got to pray and say, Lord, give me a vision. Give me your vision for how you want my business to look and my church to look, my ministry to look, my, my family to look, my finances to look. And I love this word vision. Another thing about the word vision is that in the Hebrew, the word vision is a word called kazon, and the word kazon means divine revelation, a divine revelation. So I'm, I got a definition for a vision that I want you to write down. Vision, vision is a clear mental picture of what could be Fueled by the conviction that it should be. I want you to write that down. Vision is a clear mental picture of what could be. Fueled by the conviction that it should be. So once again, you look at your life and you say, I don't like the way that it is. I don't like the way it's looking right now. Things shouldn't be this way. Vision then says, what do I want it to look like? Getting a clear picture of what that looks like is the starting point of change. Because after I know and after I see what it's supposed to look like, I know what it could be. But then along with knowing what it could be, I then need a conviction, a burning conviction of what it should be. When I have a conviction of what it should be, I'm motivated every single day to do what it takes to make it happen. And according to the verse we read, without a vision, the people perish, or without a divine revelation, I've come to realize that God does not just want us to live by motivation, he wants us to live by revelation. You know, you go to um, YouTube today and you can type in motivational speeches and there's like thousands and thousands of motivational talks from um, people. And every day I know people who religiously listen to these motivational speeches to keep themselves pumped and hyped, you know? And I found that while motivation is great, motivation is like taking a bath. You got to do it every day. <laughs> to stay motivated, you got to motivate yourself every day. <laughs> revelation, on the other hand, is greater than motivation. Because when you get a revelation from God's word, that divinely persuades you of what should be based on his promises, based off of what he has spoken over your life. That one revelation will drive you for the rest of your life. Abraham got a vision that God was going to make his name great and that he was going to be able to have children when, he, when his wife was barren. And that one revelation that Abraham had drove him for the rest of his life. You see, revelation is greater than motivation because one word from God can change your heart posture forever. This is why God wants us to be a people of revelation. Motivation is fine. People make a lot of money motivating people. But in the body of Christ, in the church, what we want is revelation. Hallelujah. Say, I need a revelation that will change my situation. This is why Jesus said to Peter, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You can't motivate people into the kingdom. <laughs> You can't be motivated to serve God. You need a revelation from God as to why he's worthy to be served. And once that revelation hits your heart, nobody has to pump you up 
every Sunday. No one has to wake you up. Sundays, we're not having motivational talks here. I'm filling you with vision and revelation of who God says you are and what God says he can, you can accomplish on this earth. If you're looking for motivation, turn on Joel Osteen. I listen to him too. I love him. He's a great motivational teacher. Sometimes I don't want to listen to deep people all the time. I just put on Joel Osteen, and I just feel better. <laughs> Everybody has a place. He got a part to play, too. Some people want to talk about the 10th dimensions of faith, and I'm, I don't really want to think that deep this morning. I just... <laughs> I just want to hear, today is a good day. Today is going to be your best day. Hallelujah. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that vision that we are contending for as a church comes from the, the greatest prayer that Jesus gave us to pray. When Jesus said to pray this prayer, he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know what the conviction that Jesus had while he was on this earth? That things are to be in earth as it is in heaven. That's the revelation, the vision that Jesus had while he was on this planet. And that's the conviction that we want. That the, the things that we said vision is a clear mental picture of what could be, fueled by the conviction of what should be. So things should be on earth as it is in heaven. That was what God originally intended when he created you and me, when he created humanity, that we were going to make things look on earth the way it looks in heaven. So when Jesus came to the earth, he knew there's no sickness in heaven. So when he, when he met sick people, what did he do? He healed the sick because there's no sickness in heaven. We got to understand that what is in heaven is supposed to be on earth. And the church has the divine privilege of helping to facilitate the coming of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Religion made you believe that all Christianity was about was about living a good, safe life and then one day going to heaven. Jesus never taught us that. He said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. He told us to pray that things would be here on earth. He taught us how to bring heaven to earth, not worry about going to heaven after we leave earth. That's religion. So when I think about what should be compared to what could be, I'm convicted, I'm persuaded by the Lord that there is a church that is going to continue to pick up where Jesus left off and his, and his apostles left off and everyone else that has come, bef that has come after him, that, they, hey, th is there poverty in heaven? Yeah, there should be no poverty in our lives. There shouldn't be no poverty in our neighborhoods. Right? The, the kingdom of God wants to invade every situation, every circumstance that is plaguing the planet. And the only way that we can see the full freedom and the full manifestation of all that God wants for us is if we continue to say yes to the vision and say yes to the plan to see things on earth as it is in heaven. It's more than just a prayer. This is not a prayer. This is a mandate for the church. And in order to make that happen, we have, there are five convictions of our church, five core convictions. There are five things that as a church, I believe that we need to be convicted of in order to make that vision come to pass. So the first conviction that we have as a church, number one, is to be a presence-driven church. Everybody say presence-driven church. And what does that simply mean? 
We have a conviction that in order for us to even see things on earth as in heaven, it starts with us recreating the atmosphere of heaven through passionate prayer, intense praise, and intimate worship. Every time we pray, like we gathered here today, as we lift up our songs, as we sang together as a church, and as we worship the Lord like I told you guys to do just now, what we're doing is we're creating, recreating the atmosphere of heaven. Is there worship in heaven? Is there worship in heaven? Are they worshiping Jesus? Absolutely. 24-7, you can find that in the book of Revelation. The Bible says it's one thing you're going to find in heaven all the time is worship. There are creatures created literally to sit before the throne of God and worship him day and night. And the Bible says, and they rest not day or night. They don't go to sleep. They're, they're created to just simply say, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. They worship. That's why I always teach people, God doesn't need your worship. He got more than enough worship. <laughs> worship is not for God as much as it is for you. You need to worship because as you worship, you begin to penetrate the veil of the natural realm and you press into the spirit realm where you can begin to receive God's provision and supernatural resources. Worship is your way into, the, into heaven. <laughs> I said worship is your way into heaven. Hallelujah. You want to recreate the atmosphere of heaven in your life? It starts with worship. So that's what we do as a church. Our church was birthed out of, a, out of a people just gathering just to simply seek the Lord. Over 10 years ago, we used to just gather on Monday nights just to seek his presence and worship. And out of his presence, we began to see supernatural healings. We began to see people healed of, of all sorts of diseases and, 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 and uh, paralysis and, and all sorts of things. People getting delivered from demonic oppression. The supernatural flows out of the presence of God. And so we prioritize worship in this church um, because we know that it produces this, the power of God to make the work of God possible. Amen? We're going to do a series on worship later on in this year because I want to teach you and coach you how to press in and how to access the presence. It's one of the most important things that you could ever do. Amen? So that's the first thing. We are a presence-driven church. And there's a verse there, Exodus 33. You can write that down, verse 14. It's when Moses literally prayed and asked God, hey, God, don't let us go into the promised land if your presence doesn't go, bef go before us. Because Moses knew, he said, what separated us from the rest of the people on earth is that we have your real presence. You can't go to a mosque and find the presence of God. You can't go to the Buddhist temple and find the presence of God. I tried it. Unless I brought him with me, but I've experimented. I've prayed for Muslims. And then after I pray with them, they're like, what is that? I'm like, it's called the Holy Spirit. It's called the presence of God. They pray five days, five times a day, but they don't feel nothing. They, don't, they can't access the presence of God because we can only the people who know the name of Jesus can open up heaven and release his presence in the earth. So the presence of God makes a difference. Number two, we want to be, another conviction we have is to be a Jesus-centered church. You might say, well, that sounds obvious, right? A church is supposed to be centered on Jesus. But a lot of churches you go into, they, it, it, Jesus might be on, the, on the, the name of the building, but Jesus, <laughs> their traditions are what drive the church or their traditions are what they're centered on. It's important that we discover that when we say that, hey, we're going to be centered on Jesus, that the, Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. And whatever Jesus said to do is what we're going to do. What Jesus taught his disciples to do is what we are teaching you to do right now. So when I tell you to believe that healings can happen, miracles can happen, why? It's because that's what his disciples saw. 
And if we are his disciples, the works that he did, we should be doing also, and greater works than these shall we do. John 14, 12. So we want to model our lives after Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Number three, another core conviction we have is to be a grace-based church. A grace-based church. Everybody say grace. Grace. In um, the verse John 1, verse 17, the Bible says that uh, the Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's no way that you can do everything that Jesus asked you to do without his grace. Grace is unique to Jesus Christ. The law came with Moses, but grace came with Jesus. So when people try to downplay grace, it's like they're trying to downplay Jesus. You cannot do the works that Christ did without the spirit of grace. The the essence of how he came to this earth, it was all based on grace. The Bible says in uh, in Ephesians 2.8 that we are saved, how? By grace. You can't even get saved without grace. So how could we think that we can do anything else in Jesus' name without grace? Grace is God's undeserved favor, unmerited favor. It means that God will give you the power to do what you can't do in your own strength. Grace is a divine enablement. You don't deserve it, but God says, let me do you the favor. It takes grace to live right. It takes grace not to cheat on your spouse. It takes grace to not slap somebody in the head or in the face when they bump you the wrong way. It takes grace to keep loving people. God has to do you the favor. He has to give you the strength to do it. Paul said, come on, he said, when when we are what? Weak. Then we are strong because his grace becomes sufficient for us. Church, we're going to learn about grace this year. We're going, to do, we're going to spend some time teaching on grace because I need your life to be charged and electrified with this truth. So many people are trying to live life on their own strength when God wants to give you his strength, his grace, so that you can achieve everything that he's called you to be in this earth. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to be a grace-based church. Or we are, but we want to continue to be. Number four, the fourth conviction is that we are a people-focused church. A people-focused church. What does that mean? That we, we, we prioritize the presence of God, but we also prioritize the people. Why? Because Jesus died for people. Amen? The whole mission of what we're here to do is to help serve people, love on people, and reveal Jesus to people so that people can come in to the family of God. There is something worth dying for in every person. Look at somebody next to you and say, there's something worth dying for in me. If you knew how much I was worth, say, say, if you knew how much I was worth, You would want to die for me too. (laughs) From heaven's point of view, God looked at you and said, that person is worth dying for. I'm going to hang on a cross because I see something in them. They don't see it yet. But if we truly see people the way heaven sees people, We would gladly give up our lives for each other. That's how much value and worth every human being has. And it's the devil that's going to want to get you to hate people, judge people, condemn people. That's not Christianity. That's not Jesus. Because Jesus, 
The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him. Jesus died for the whosoever. It doesn't matter who, what you did, where you come from. It's for everybody, this gospel. So when we have a heavenly picture of people, we want to we help people, restore people, reconnect people to God. And finally, a last conviction that we have as a church is to be a world-changing church. A world-changing church. How many of you believe that we can change the world? If you don't believe it, Jesus said we could. Matthew 28, he said the commission is to go into all the world and preach this gospel. Discipling nations. Teaching them to do everything that I've commanded you to do. You know, it's so much easier to, change, to reach the world today than Paul and Peter and the apostles' day. I could go on my phone right now and go live, and there's people all over the world that I can talk to thanks to the invention of the Internet and the technology that we have at our disposal. This is why I believe we're closer to the end of the age than we've ever been before because people all around the world are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ right now on YouTube, <laughs> on TikTok. I know there's some, some nations that are banning it, though, North Korea and them. But we're gonna, we're gonna have, we got, God got people in North Korea, too. Hallelujah. But there's a part that we're going to play. We may not be out in the world changing the world right now, but God is calling us. If he planted us here in our city, in Brooklyn, in New York City, he, want, he wants us to change our city. When he told the apostles in Acts 1, he said, start in your Jerusalem, then go to Samaria, then go to the uttermost parts of the earth. So in order for us to change the world, we ought to oftentimes start with changing our neighborhoods, changing our communities. If we can be faithful in, in, in helping to do those small things, doing things here that are still going to have a major impact, I believe that God will look at our faithfulness to steward our Jerusalem, our, our New York City, our South Carolina, where we're planting our other location, and wherever else God is going to send us and use us, that God is going to raise up a people who have this conviction that what should be is that things are in earth as it is in heaven, and I believe that it could be because I'm signing up to be the hands and feet of Christ to help make it happen. No vision can come to pass without a visionary and a people who run with the vision. No vision. Your vision won't come to pass until you decide to get up, put on your boots, roll up your sleeves, and actually get to work. We're not looking for somebody else to make it happen. We are saying, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. We're not settling for anything less than God's best for our lives. It should be that my life is filled with joy because there is joy in heaven. I'm not living another day full of depression and anxiety. That's not what's going on in heaven. Peace is in heaven. So my life should be filled with peace, not drama and chaos and toxicity and dysfunction. I'm filled by the conviction that what is in heaven should be in my life, should be in your life, should be in our cities and in our communities. And I pray that that vision is going to become a conviction on the inside of you. And that every day you're waking up enthused and passionate about, Lord, how can I bring heaven today? How can I bring heaven at my job? How can I bring heaven where you're sending me today? So whether I wake up on a Monday or, on a, or a Sunday, it doesn't matter for me. My conviction is the same. Things should be around me as it is in heaven So, this year we have a few vision projects or a few focuses that we want you all to begin to understand. There are three main things that we're going to focus on. The first thing is that I want you guys to understand that we're going to have, I told you, that in order for us to make this vision come to pass is that there needs to be a people who are running with the vision. And in 2024, 
We're focusing on three things. We have a heart for the people. Say heart for the people. A heart for worship and a heart for the house. And a heart for the people begin by our desire to, A, reach more people and to disciple more people. Amen? We want to reach more people and we want to disciple more people. And the way we're going to reach more people, church, is first things first is going to be through our outreach and our evangelism. We are a church. We are giving church. Many of you know that. We love to bless people. In fact, just last year alone, we blessed over 455 families with either food, clothes, or basic essentials. I'm sorry, 575 families. It's more than I thought. And we did this without city funding. <laughs> this is what your generosity helped us do. Over 575 families, blessed, introduced to the love of God through what you were able to contribute. And I believe that this year, it's going to take more of your love and your compassion. All it takes is your compassion. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the people. The, the, when you're moved with compassion, God is going to give you this supernatural urge to help people. And that urge, as you step into it and lean into it, you begin to find that God begins to supernaturally also begin to supply everything you need to continue to make those things happen. I believe that it's our church, church. It's not our job to change the world. It's our job to love the church. It's to love our city and to love the world. And as we love people, God is going to change the world. As we love our city, God is going to change our city. We show up to be his hands and feet, to serve, to pray for and care for people. And God is the one who changes the hearts of man. See, you can't force a person to change. You can't force anybody to serve God. All you can do is love people without, a, without forcing them to change. See, the, the funny thing is, people change the most when you love them without forcing them to change. You believe in people when they don't believe in themselves. It's like, why are you helping me? It's because I know you're worth more than this. See that? That's called grace. Giving people what they don't deserve or what they think they don't deserve. So we're going to do more outreach. We're going to love on people. Last year, we also, um, as we reach people, we bring people into the family. There's people who say, you know what, I want to join. I want to be connected to this family, and that's okay. And once they come in, we bring them into Deeper Hunger, which is our membership track. And just last year, I believe we had over 14 people who completely graduated Deeper Hunger and officially joined um, H4G Church. And so that, those are the people who came last year and are, and are now here. We had over 15 baptisms, so people who came here and got baptized. We had a, um, we had a rooftop baptism last year, and we're going to do another one. So if you've never been baptized before, water baptized, and you want to say, hey, I want to truly demonstrate that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm going to encourage you to sign up for our next baptism. But we're going to do a lot more of those same things, outreach, baptisms, uh, bringing people into, mem into fellowship, into membership here. Um, along with the heart for the people is our heart for the house. We're going to make some improvements in this place. Uh, I want you to just look around this building. This is not our building, but this is the building that we're using right now. And if you can see, there's some things that need to be enhanced in here, appearance-wise. Uh, but I got the green light for us that we can enhance some of those things. All right. So... <laughs> so we're gonna make we're gonna be making some improvements. It's gonna be both visually and audio wise, and so um, we're getting ready to enhance our sound. So as soon as next week, you're gonna hear a difference in the quality of sound that's coming here. Amen. Um, the the um, lighting is gonna change, and over the next few months, you're gonna see changes in here. 
So I want you to stay tuned for that because I believe that we need to give God our best. Um, we're getting ready to live stream as well this year. So as we live stream our services, people are going to tune in. And I want them to see, I want our, pre our presentation of the greatest message on earth to be the best presentation that we can give them. Amen. And so that's going to happen as, we, as you all continue to help us by serving and, and stepping up and sowing and giving to the vision because you will determine if our vision can manifest next month or it's going to take eight months or 12 months. It's all contingent on your generosity. So continue to help partner with us. And here's another thing. We're also uh, going to roll out another service time, a morning service. A morning service. A morning service. For the last 10 years, we've had people say, you know what, you know, Pastor, I'll come to H4G, but you guys start so late. And I was like, yeah, we got people that like the late service. But then there were so many people who said, I would come, but I, I like to have church in the morning. So if you're an early riser, we're going to have an early service for you. We're, we're going to roll that out. How many of you would like to have an early church service? You would like to come early? Oh, look. <laughs> look, we got some hands up. Look, we got some of our guests saying they'll come if it was early, too. <laughs> So we're actually looking at rolling out a 9 a.m. service this year, a 9 a.m. service. And hold up, the goal is not for you to come to both 9 and 2. We don't want you coming to both. We want to be able to reach new people at our early service as well. So if you want to start coming to, more, to the early, that's cool too. But I'm not saying, you know, some churches, they got three services in one day, and they want you to come to all three services. That's not what we're doing. But we believe that by creating another net or another option for people, we're going to reach more people by having another service. Amen? So we're going to try that this year. Let's see, let's see if God blesses that. <laughs> and finally, finally, heart for worship. Everybody say heart for worship. And once again, as I told you guys, the foundation of our church is worship, prioritizing the presence of God our ministry to the Lord as priests, as we've been learning on our Tuesday night Bible studies. Um, in order to make that happen, we want to get back to our city worship nights. We used to call them presence nights, but we are calling them city worship nights now because we want to invite our city. We want to invite people to come and join us and experience the tangible presence of God through worship. Amen. So we're going to be setting those, sending out dates for our city worship nights. And we're also getting, in, getting back into the studio and we're going to release our next project. In 2019, we released an EP called Sound of Hunger to Earth with Love. And we released that right before the pandemic. And then the pandemic kind of threw everything off with our plans and what we intended to do. But, um, we believe that it's time to get back in, and God has blessed our church with a unique sound, and I believe it's, we're going to cultivate that sound, and we want to record it and put it out there for the world to sing along. Homegrown songs, new songs, prophetic songs, the anthems that God is going to deposit in us. You're going to be hearing us singing our own songs this year. Amen. So new original songs, we're going to be singing these on Sundays and our city worship nights. And um, I believe that through the albums and through the songs that we're going to release, it's more than just songs that people are going to have to stream on their Spotify or Apple Music or wherever you listen to music, but it's to help disciple people into the revelation and the conviction of this house. We want to sing songs about the presence so people can understand how to prioritize the presence. We want to teach people. You know, songs, hymns primarily were written to teach. It wasn't just for you to sing. You were supposed to be discipled through songs. So we want to take the songs that God is going, to, is going to give us and teach theology and doctrine through them. That's going to help raise people, um, bring people into the, the presence of God. Amen? So I believe that's all, folks. That's our vision for uh, 2024. And um, 
we want you to um, make sure you check out our website, h4gchurch.com forward slash, well, no, just go to h4gchurch.com. Everything else that you're going to see, we're going to have all of our teams. Um, if you want to serve on our, our events team, you want to serve on our kids' church team this year, if you want to serve on our hospitality team or our outreach team when we hit the streets, or our worship team, if there's any team that you would love to say, hey, you know what, I want to be a part of this vision, some, at some point, this one, our prayer team, we have a merch team. That, uh, if you guys look in the back, we also got some brand new merch. Our merch is available in the back after service. You can go take a look at that. Um, we have hoodies. We got mugs. Um, but we, we, we are rolling out new merch this year as well. But things are rolling, guys. Um, I just believe that something, if you say, you know what, God, I want to be a part of this vision, you're going to be blessed. My last point, I remember my dad taught me this. He said to me, he, I remember there was a guy in our church, a few people in our church, in the church I grew up in with my dad. He said, if there's anybody that, that doesn't have a job, let them serve at church. And I said, why? He said, because whenever they serve the house of God, if they take care of God's house, God will take care of their house. And I took what my dad said and I applied that principle. And I always told people, if you want to see favor in your life, find something to do at church. It could be holding up a sign, sweeping the floor, find something. It doesn't even matter what it is. Find something to do. One of our people, she was here. Um, she was in working. She used to do media. She used to run. She used to be a part of media. And I said, hey, can you run social media, our social media page for us? And then she was like, you know what? I was trying to find a different career. I didn't know if I should do that. I said, well, listen, we really need somebody to do media for us. I think you should do it since you're not working. She was like, all right. I, she did it. Within three months of doing media for our church, she got offered the biggest contract she ever got from Volkswagen, the company, hiring her to do media for them. I mean, in just three months. There is favor when you get planted in the house of the Lord. If you're in this church, if you're in this place right now, and you say, hey, you know, I'm coming here for the first time, and you don't have a home church, I'm going to encourage you to consider hungry for God. And maybe not now. I want you to come back two more times. And after the third visit, I want you to decide, you're like, you know what? I feel like I want to be connected to this because I know that there's something happening here, something special. It's not something you're going to find out in the world. It's not even something you're going to find on YouTube. Church online is cool. It's all right. But it's all right. It's cute. But, but God wants you to be connected to his people. Amen? So let's all stand. Let's bless the Lord for what he's doing. We're going to pray into this, and we're going to leave. We're going to be dismissed.